All right, well, <clears throat> again, we have a very short passage um, this morning, Acts 16, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> I'm trying to be careful not to bite off too much because I, I have taken large chunks of Acts and kind of gone through it quickly. But I think every once in a while it, it, it helps to just pause and maybe look a little bit more deeply. And we do have, you know, some things here that are told us about... Um, uh, Timothy, we have some things told us in other parts of Scripture, and we have some things we can deduce simply by what would draw Paul's attention from what he writes in other parts of Scripture just regarding Christians in general. So we want to build a little bit of a summary of what a Christian looks like and uh, what it is that the Spirit of God is doing within us uh, to encourage us uh, and to give us, again, a target that we need to aim at because we know our flesh, sadly, often gets, drags our eyes back down to the world and lowers the standards. And, you know, every once in a while we need to be reminded what that standard is, what Christ looks like and what, it, what He looks like in us. So let's go ahead and read this short passage and um, we'll take a look at it. Acts 16, verses 1 through 5. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but uh, his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Well, may the Lord bless again His Word to encourage us this morning and again to give us something to aim at with regard to our sanctification, if I can use that word. <clears throat> now, last time... Uh, we are in Acts, we were looking at the dispute that broke out between Paul and Barnabas as they were teaching the, the new converts uh, that are in Antioch uh, and just seeing them grow in Christ, as uh, the way Sinclair Ferguson would put it, as they were pouring His Word into them so that they might become more like Jesus. They began to think about the young converts, the young believers, how they were doing in the churches that they had planted on that first missionary trip. Uh, I'm sure questions came into their minds like, uh, were they remaining faithful to Christ and to His worship, the worship of God? Uh, were they continuing to grow in their understanding of how to trust Him in, in every circumstance, how to serve Him? Uh, were they sharing what they had to, to meet the needs of, of others and reaching out to their neighbors with the gospel? Or had Satan succeeded in dividing them? He's very good at that. Or had he led them away from their commitment to Christ? Was there something that they could do in order to help them, even as they were helping the young believers uh, who were at Antioch? Well, because of their concern, we saw that they both agreed that they needed to go back to see how they were doing. They disagreed, however, on whether Mark should go with them. Now, Paul didn't think he should because he had deserted them on the field earlier in Pamphylia. But Barnabas, again, being the son of encouragement that he was, thought that he should go with them because by now he was past that. He had kind of grown past that. He was ready again for service. And again, we are talking about four or five years. I mean, how long does somebody get put on the shelf before they can be used again? Well, again, Barnabas thought he was ready. Paul thought... He wasn't, and I think that'll become important as we see how Paul views Timothy. But when they couldn't agree, they decided to go their separate ways. Barnabas took Mark, and he sailed for Cyprus, which is retracing the steps of the first missionary journey, while Paul chose Silas and headed north in order to reach the churches by land rather than by sea. Now, the important thing that we saw last time was, was this, that their disagreement ultimately did not get in the way of the work. Maybe it got in the way of their friendship, you know, at least uh, temporarily. Uh, 
But the Lord used these efforts effectively to, um, I mean, this division, to double their efforts to reach the lost. I mean, think about this. Now we've got two missionary teams rather than just one. The Lord uses even, you know, even the sins of His people, if there is sin in this case, even their disagreements, to further His cause. But also we saw that they did not let this get in the way of their friendship. We see later in Scripture that they still had a very high opinion of each other. And they still loved each other as brothers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I noted last time, this is one thing that seems so, you know, to happen so seldom today. It seems like believers are, you know, far less likely to be reconciled if they have a difference, even than unbelievers. But it shouldn't be this way. I mean, Jesus gave us His Holy Spirit and He gave us His love so that we might cover over the offenses of our brothers and sisters, cover over every offense, that we might preserve the unity that Jesus prayed for in His high priestly prayer, that we might be one. He wasn't talking about just individual congregations. He was actually talking about His whole church, but certainly it applies to individual congregations as well, that we need to be able to forgive and overlook and think the best of one another and continue to love each other and pursue each other even, again, through these offenses so that we might preserve the unity of His church. If we don't, Satan is one. He's divided the church. Remember what First Corinthians, or well, actually in First Corinthians, what the church looked like? That's what Satan wants to do to all of the churches so that he basically keeps us from doing what the Lord has called us to do, which is to reach out to the lost, you know, that are outside these walls. We're so busy in, you know, in our infighting that we never get to the work. Well, even though, as I said before, Mark did not measure up in Paul's eyes, as Paul and Silas continued to go through the churches that they had planted a few years earlier, at least Paul and Barnabas, they found somebody who did measure up, and that is Timothy. This morning, I want us just to think about Timothy for a little while to see what it is that Paul saw in him. Again, so that we might know what it is we should be aiming at and what we should be looking for in ourselves. I think all of us um, probably have two concerns as believers. Um, and if you don't have these concerns, talk to me. I'd like to, like to know how you overcome them. But every once in a while, we struggle with assurance. We want to know that we do belong to Jesus. Well, here's some of the ways we can know that we do and overcome, again, the flesh that's trying to tell us we don't belong to Him or the enemy. But we also want to be more useful to Him, don't we? And usefulness doesn't come just by doing nothing, you know, by not pursuing the Lord, by not reading, by not praying, by not serving. It, it comes by growing into the image of Jesus. So we want to know what to be aiming at in that regard as well. Now, <clears throat> Luke tells us that, that as Paul and Silas were traveling north, they eventually came to Derby and to Lystra. Now, remember, these are the cities that Paul and Barnabas earlier had escaped to when the Jews and the Gentiles in Iconium wanted to stone them. And it was at Lystra that the Lord did some pretty mighty works. It was there that He gave Paul the power to heal the layman. And it was such a display of God's power that was so evident to everyone, again, unlike faith healings that we see today, that the people who saw it thought that Paul and Barnabas were actually gods and they tried to worship them. But it was also here that <laughs> just after that event that the Jews from Iconium came and convinced the people there to stone Paul and they actually did stone him. But as we know, Paul got right back up, went right back into the city and continued to do the work the Lord had called him to do, the supernatural healing, something that Paul actually died. But again, that was two very powerful acts of God that took place in those cities. Now, this time around, they find this promising young disciple by the name of Timothy. Luke tells us here that Timothy had a Jewish mother, and he had a Greek father. And, and that, I think, stands out to us as something that's unusual, because mixed marriages were forbidden in the Old Testament. Jews were not to marry non-Jews. You know, they're also forbidden, by the way, in the New Testament as well. Believers are not to marry unbelievers, although we still see something like that happening today. 
But in this situation, these kinds of marriages must have been perhaps more common than we think. Uh, when the Jews were dispersed among the nations, uh, they were much more, had to become much more intimate in their relationships with uh, the, the Greeks, and um, especially, you would, you would suppose, Jewish women uh, who needed support because there weren't a lot of jobs for, for women in those days, perhaps needed to marry Greek men in order to meet their needs. Now, Timothy had earlier been converted through Paul's ministry. And we do believe that, that Paul was the one who was the means that the Lord used to convert Timothy because of the way that Paul affectionately refers to him from time to time. And by the way, we shouldn't have to be the means of conversion to somebody in order to have this kind of affection for one another. Uh, depending upon where we are in our growth in the Lord and where we might be in our, our physical age, uh, we are to look at one another's family and consider, you know, uh, again, if you're, if you're younger, the older men as fathers or the older women as mothers and those more your age as sisters and brothers. Paul looks at Timothy as his son. He calls him my true child in the faith, my son, my beloved son, and my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. Now, we know that Paul expressed on other occasions this kind of uh, familial love for the people he ministered to, uh, called himself uh, and those with him uh, nursing mothers uh, towards the, the, the believers there, seeking to nurture them and to help them grow. Now, certainly, again, Paul had that kind of affection for Timothy. It appears from what Paul writes in 2 Timothy, what we've already seen, that Timothy's grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice were first brought to Christ through Paul's preaching, and then Timothy perhaps shortly after that. Again, he writes 2 Timothy 1.5, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. And again, an indicator that uh, the grace of Christ was so at work within Timothy that Paul could see it. But again, the order in which the Lord saved these family members, it, it appears as though the grandmother and mother came first, and then perhaps through their influence as well as Paul's, Timothy also came to know Christ. Now, even though they weren't converted, any of them, until Paul brought the gospel on his first missionary journey, we recognize that Lois and Eunice were still devout Jews. And from the passage of 2 Timothy 3.15, we realize they had taught Timothy the Scriptures from his childhood. Again, I don't think we should think of it as they began doing this once they were converted to Christ, and four or five years later, Timothy has grown into this man that's now useful to the Lord. But this is something they did as faithful Jewish parents, teaching Timothy, teaching their children. And this may explain why Timothy had matured so quickly in the faith in these four or five years. Timothy had already gained a good reputation, Luke tells us, among those in Lystra and Iconium, as well, I imagine, as in, as in Derby. Now, I think this answers the question, why should we teach the Bible to our children, right? Well, the Lord commands it. That's certainly reason enough. Uh, it's certainly the means that the Lord uses to save them when He does. Uh, it doesn't guarantee their salvation, but it is the means that He uses. But we also need to realize that if and when the Lord does save them, it actually gives them a wonderful head start, doesn't it, in knowing how they might serve Him. Again, I would just draw your attention to something I said earlier where Paul tells us that the Old Testament Scriptures, all Scriptures inspired by God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and in righteousness to equip us for every good work. And he was referring primarily to the Old Testament there. But that's what Lois and Eunice had been teaching Timothy. Now, we might also say that persecution from the Jews in that area might also have sped things along. Again, this is where Paul had earlier been stoned. And I think nothing has quite the potential to accelerate spiritual growth like trials. At least they should. When we're under a trial, I think it shows us what we really are. It certainly shows us all the yuck that's in our lives, all the sin, all the dross that, 
comes to the surface, and so we do see things that sometimes surprise us, but that's the Lord bringing it to mind, bringing it to sight, showing us what it is we need to deal with so that we can deal with it. And by the way, those things are going to keep coming up until we finally do get rid of those things, until we finally put those things to death. Now, what was it exactly that Paul saw in this young man? Now, Luke doesn't give us a detailed list here, but it shouldn't be hard to figure out. I'm sure he saw what he desired to see in, in every believer, in everyone professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was certainly what he was looking for. And I think Paul summarizes what that is in Galatians 5, 6, which interestingly enough, um, you know, is something the Puritans were so familiar with, something that Jonathan Edwards pointed to again and again. But yet the odd thing was that in seminary, I recall a story being told of, uh, by Bob Strimple of the ambiguity or the question of what this passage actually is referring to. Uh, and giving a story or telling a story about how in Van Til's class one time, Van Til was asking this question, and a hand went up, I know the answer, and Van Til calls on him, and just as he does, the bell rings, everybody leaves, and he says, we never did find out what the answer to this question is. Well, it doesn't seem to be that difficult. He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. I remember in a church history class, we were reading religious affections, and I remember uh, Dr. Godfrey, whom I highly respect, saying that Jonathan Edwards and the Puritans almost replaced love or, or faith with love, saying that we're saved by love rather than by faith. And if they would actually, you know, spend a little bit more time perhaps reading Edwards, they would understand that what Edwards was talking about is what and the Puritans is what Paul is referring to here, is that genuine saving faith it works by love. Love is what makes it come alive. Love is what makes it active. Love is what makes it real. Love is what makes you desire Jesus and trust in Jesus. They shouldn't be seen as two separate things, really. I mean, I realize there is a distinction. But faith grows out of this love and this love of the Holy Spirit, but it's this love that is the change the Spirit makes that brings about all the things that we see in a Christian. It brings about that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it brings about that obedience to the law of God. Now, when Paul looked at Timothy, he didn't see Timothy trusting what the Jews trusted, you know, which is what Paul was addressing here in Galatians, for his acceptance with God. The circumcision of the flesh, Timothy wasn't even circumcised, but he saw Rather, what the Spirit does in the heart of a true believer, he saw the circumcision of the heart. He saw the evidence of that. He saw the love and the faith that Timothy had towards the Savior, that Jesus was his only hope. I think he saw in Timothy obedience also to his word, the word he had been taught his whole life, which had come alive in his heart since the Spirit of God had entered through that work of, again, the Spirit's work through the gospel. He saw him living in the way that Jesus said that we will live if we actually do love him. Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So he saw that Timothy loved the Lord and that he was faithfully worshiping him. He saw that Timothy loved his neighbor, that he was feeding the hungry, clothing the poor as he had the ability, and was also offering a greater treasure, you know, the riches of the gospel to those who were poor and destitute, as many as would receive it. I don't think Paul would have taken Timothy on his missionary journey if he didn't see Timothy already reaching out with the gospel. I mean, you don't just take people that don't do this in real life and put them in a situation where they have to do it all day long. Now, again, no one knows, can know for certain, really, why somebody who professes to know Jesus does the things that he or she does because we can't see the heart. That's the reason why, by the way, so many books are written on this subject during the Puritan era. The almost Christian discovered religious affections and, and so forth because people can do right things for wrong reasons. Judas followed Jesus, didn't he? He was one of the disciples, but he followed him not because he loved Jesus, but he followed him because of the money. 
he liked to steal from the bag that he was in charge of, of carrying, the common money bag of the disciples. Uh, there were many people who followed Jesus, large crowds, and Jesus on one occasion turned to them and said, unless you hate your father and mother, wife, children, all your possessions, even your life, you can't be my disciple. And I think that turned a lot of people off. There was another large crowd of people who came after Jesus, and Jesus said to them, you came here because you ate of the fish and the loaves. You, you really don't love me. And I tell you the truth, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And all those people left. Okay, there's people follow Jesus for various reasons, and it's not always because of God's grace. Now, we need to recognize that Paul could not see the heart either. I don't think he was given that insight because I believe we have examples of people that Paul trusted. It turned out not to be faithful. And he even talks about looking at Timothy's life and expressing the idea of the certainty that that, that, that grace is in him but not because I can see in your heart, I can see the Spirit inside your soul, but because I can see how it's working, it's him, His work is working itself out in your life. He believed that Timothy was a genuine believer, and he wasn't actually disappointed because he actually was a true believer. Paul later writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition, for I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of His proven worth, that He served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving His Father. So again, what is it that Paul saw? He saw Timothy giving his life to honor the Lord, to serve his interests, that is, the Lord's interests, because he loved him. And that is the mark of the work of the Spirit of God, that love that drives us to honor the Lord Jesus. Now, Luke gives to us two more examples of how this love worked itself out in Timothy's life. Uh, first, Timothy submitted to the Jerusalem council. I mean, when it says that Paul took him and had him circumcised, it almost seems at first glance that he was going against the council's directions, but actually he was keeping them. Paul had him circumcised, he says in verse 3, because of the Jews. Now, the Jews in that area knew that Timothy's father was a Greek, and we know that Greeks had an aversion to circumcision. That's why we have the category of God-fearer. That's a Greek or a Gentile who has really attached himself to the worship of Yahweh. And um, so he, they're going to the temple, but they don't become circumcised because they have something against circumcision. So they're uncircumcised believers, and they're called God-fearers. And that may explain why Timothy was not circumcised. But Paul performed this right on Timothy to remove any offense that that might cause among the Jews who knew him and who knew his father was a Greek. Now, remember, the point of the Jerusalem Council's decision that we saw two weeks ago was that we are not to use our liberty in Christ to put a stumbling block in the way of someone's salvation. Now, in this case, the fact that Timothy wasn't circumcised would actually create that offense and that stumbling block. Now, Timothy was no longer required to be circumcised under the new covenant, but he willingly submitted to it uh, for the sake of the Jews. And by the way, it's also true that the Jews would never allow any uncircumcised person to preach in their synagogues. So this would not only remove that offense that the Jews might have, that here's a, a you know, son of a Jewish woman who hasn't been circumcised, but it would also open the door for him to be able to preach in those synagogues. So he submitted to that. He was willing to do that. He was willing to do whatever needed to be done to serve Christ's interests, to further his cause. But secondly, we see he also went with Paul and Silas to do the work. We read in verses 4 and 5. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Daily. 
So they, at this point, includes Timothy. He's joined them. He's working with them. He's serving Christ and his interests. Luke goes on to tell us about Timothy's involvement in missionary work in the rest of his book. And we know that two of Paul's letters were addressed to encourage Timothy to that very end. So Timothy was serving the Lord in the mission field and also as a pastor and as evangelist and so forth. Now, Paul once wrote to the Corinthians, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. And he also wrote to the Philippians in Philippians 3.17, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Now, Jesus, of course, gave us a perfect example of, of how we are to live for the glory of God. But we need to realize Jesus has given us other examples as well in less than perfect men and women. Everybody outside of Christ is, is not perfect. To show us what He can do in us through the Holy Spirit, we can grow more into His image, and sometimes it can be faster than we think. This morning, he points us to Timothy as somebody who went from conversion to usefulness in, in a matter of four to five years. Again, he did have a leg up. We need to realize that. But it can happen more quickly, uh, depending upon, I think, of course, the Lord's will, but also our involvement in, in the process. So what is it we should learn from Timothy with regard to that growth? Well, the first thing we need to see, of course, is that Jesus has given us His Holy Spirit to make us usable in the kingdom. He doesn't make us perfect, and we don't have to be perfect in order to be, to, to be usable, but He gives us the Spirit to make us useful. And the way He does that is by giving us love, love for the Lord. Again, that's, that's the difference. Uh, if I, again, may repeat Jonathan Edwards, it's something that often escapes our thinking, and that is the only difference between the believer and the unbeliever is the believer loves the Lord and the unbeliever doesn't. And what the believer loves about the Lord is the very thing the unbeliever hates him for, and that is his holiness. The Spirit of God gives us love for holiness. And, of course, the Lord is holy, so we love him. And we trust Him. We trust the Lord Jesus Christ when He's presented to us because we, we love this Savior. We want the Savior. And He also, of course, gives us love for our neighbor, which though we may not find holiness in our neighbor, we love the Lord and we want to help our neighbor so that we're concerned for our neighbor's physical well-being, but especially their spiritual well-being, that they might come to know Jesus because they are, after all, created in the image of God. Now, this example of Timothy tells us that this love that God gives to us will also become visible in our lives. It's not something hidden. It's not something that others should, you know, when they look at you, wonder, do you really love the Lord or not love the Lord? You know, are you just blending in, you know, like everybody else? Uh, others should be able to see it and know that we are different. Paul looked at Timothy, and he saw Timothy doing something different that made him stand out. And, and we should stand out. Jesus tells us on another occasion that we should do good works so that others may see. Let your light shine so others may see and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So not for grandstanding, but rather to draw attention to the Lord. We will have a good reputation, you know, not only in the church but outside the church if this love is actually within us. This love, interestingly enough, will move us to submit to decisions made by the leadership of the church. I mean, the leadership of the church has authority, right? But it's authority to minister the rule of Christ. It's the authority to declare and minister the Word of God. So we will submit to that when those decisions are actually based upon the Word of God, when they are biblical. I mean, after all, even Paul was scrutinized by the Bereans. They examined the Scriptures to see whether what he was saying was true. But if we have the Spirit of God within us, we'll actually be glad to know from these decisions how we might better serve and please the Lord, even as Timothy submitted to the Jerusalem Council.
will be willing to set aside the freedoms that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, even those that we might enjoy the most, so that we don't get in the way of anyone from coming to Him. Yeah, maybe I do have the liberty to do this or that, but if somebody's going to look at me and say, you can't be a Christian because you do that, or perhaps I offend some of those that do know the Lord Jesus Christ, I, I won't, won't try to injure the unity, and I certainly don't want to put a stumbling block in any other's way, so I will set it aside, at least when I'm in their presence, in order that I might draw them to Christ. And of course, we'll participate in the work, the work that the Lord has given to us of extending His kingdom in the world. We'll use our time and our strength and our gifts and our resources to that end. I hope we all realize that being Christians means that we put Christ and His concerns first, seek first the kingdom of heaven, His righteousness, that it's not something we just do on weekends, you know, not just on Sundays. We're full-time Christians. Christ is always first. He's always primary. That's what we will do, and we will use what we have to honor Him. And then lastly, we will also become examples for others to encourage them to keep pressing towards Christ's likeness. I mean, why is Timothy's character and the fact that he's singled out, why is that recorded in Scripture? I think among other things to show us what it is that attracts those that love the Lord and what are those attributes of what's useful, but also as an example to us of how we also might become useful. Now, again, <clears throat> this doesn't mean we're going to become perfect. Uh, Timothy's example teaches us that we won't become perfect. Uh, Paul had to write to him to encourage him from time to time, not to be afraid. That was one of the things he was likely to fall to and challenge just about, you know, most Christians, that's probably the number one thing that keeps us from serving the Lord in the way that we would like to is fear. But Paul reminds Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. And by the way, courage is not fearlessness. I'm sure you've heard Courage is the ability to overcome fear and to do what is right. So it's basically strength in the face of fear. If there's no fear, there's no courage. If there's no fear, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> so that's something we have to deal with. Timothy had to deal with. We're not going to be perfect. But the point is, through the work of God's Holy Spirit, we will grow. We can grow. We can be useful to the Lord. And that's certainly what we ought to be aiming at uh, as believers. Well, let, let's, um, let's bow in a word of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to learn from Timothy what to be aiming at, what the Spirit of God does, and pray that He would do that work in us more that we might become more useful to our Savior.